The following program is made possible by the Zicklin School of Business at Baruch College, CUNY. When CEOs cut corners, manipulating their company's earnings so their stock prices go up, the last line of defense is the auditor. Those little guys with the green eye shades and the plastic pocket protectors are supposed to fend off corporate wrongdoers. Of course, as Enron, WorldCom, and other corporate implosions have shown, the auditors weren't doing their jobs either. Since those scandals erupted, a lot of changes have been made. Are they enough? Is the accounting industry to be trusted again? I'm Sarah Bartlett, and this is my topic today on USA Inc. Paul Volcker is known far and wide as the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, but he also played an important role in cleaning up the fallout from the Enron scandal. He headed an oversight board that tried to fix the accounting firm Arthur Anderson and is still working with a regulatory group to establish stronger international accounting standards. Paul, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Nice to be back with you. Yeah, the timing of this is great. We just saw that Bernie Evers has been indicted at WorldCom. <laughs> a few people are the being CEO indicted. Of, we'll of see the... how many are convicted in the end. There well, seems to be a little uncertainty. But I think one of the things that this uh, brings back into our minds is the magnitude of the accounting uh, fraud that's taken place. And I know in the case of WorldCom, the number $11 billion sticks in my mind. How is that possible that accountants could miss something like that? Well, you know, we couldn't have imagined this a few years ago when some of this was going on, but nobody imagined it was going on. But I think they got caught up in a in a kind of uh, frenzy, I suppose, in, in all the wealth that was being created in Wall Street. And the accountants are not alone in uh, being culpable here. A lot of so-called gatekeepers, where were the investment bankers? Uh, where were the lawyers? Where were the consultants of various stripes? Uh, where were the business schools, some people ask? What were they teaching their students? Well, but you were right in your initial statement. The auditors, these days they don't have green eye shades, and they're not <laughs> little. Some of them were pretty well off. <laughs> Maybe that's part of the problem. But, but they are the end of the line. Their responsibility is to the investor, to the public, not to the management that hires them. It's kind of a difficult situation. Well, they're in a very special role. They are in a very special role, and I, I think uh, too often they failed in, in carrying out that role. What were some of the pressures that were put on them, and, and have those pressures gone away now with some of the reforms? Well, what's evident now, looking back, and you could see this particularly in Anderson, which is a sad case, and I had some connection with it when they uh, got in trouble. Uh, that was considered the class of the auditing firms 15 years ago. They were strict, they were disciplined, they were professional. There was a certain amount of jealousy in the other firms because they, they were so good and so professional. But they got caught up in what a lot of the firms got caught up in. They uh, began seeing what was going on around them. They wanted to make money too. They developed a big consulting practice alongside their auditing practice. The auditing which is the heart of the firm, became less and less important relatively in terms of revenue. The emphasis was more and more on producing revenues and less and less on producing good audits. And it's, again, they were not the only professional group that's been subject to these kinds of pressures. Well, how much has that problem been taken care of now? I mean, the well, consulting practices have been sold off in some cases. Obviously, there's so much going on. Uh, Anderson was indicted for other reasons. They're out of existence. Some of the ills of the Anderson firm were evidently true in some of the other firms, so they're pretty well shook up, <laughs> obviously, uh, psychologically and otherwise. But I think the, the profession is having trouble getting its bearings again. Uh, it's, it's really a, a great shock, and we'd like to see them settle down and get back to the core business of auditing and do a good job. They're going to be forced to, I think, because of the so-called so Sarbanes-Oxley legislation, a, a very sweeping piece of legislation that grew out of this that is primarily directed toward 
maintaining some discipline on the auditing profession. It's too bad that that had to happen. Nobody likes to see that kind of really very intrusive regulation. Uh, but, but one I, of the things that I think has changed is to the extent that they've lost some of the revenues that came from consulting practices, are they not under more economic pressure? And will well, that not right now, uh, they are in a position to charge more for their auditing, which isn't entirely bad. <laughs> but uh, some people think that auditing kind of became a loss leader to get the consulting revenues. Uh, in some cases, I suspect that was true. But in any event, the auditors were not very well paid, in my judgment, for the auditing job for some companies in particular that have enormously complex financial operations in the best of circumstances. And if you're going to do a good auditing job, it takes manpower, it takes skilled manpower, it takes time. And I, I think it just was not being done adequately. So now they're getting to charge more, mm -hmm. and I think they're very conscious of the fact that they have to maintain their reputation. But what about the pressure from the corporate side? Has that changed? I mean, I've never heard a CEO say, man, give me a really tough audit, and I want to pay more for that. Well, but I think some of them, in retrospect, wish they had had a tougher audit. You know, you would think ideally that a chief executive officer wants to know what's going on in his company, and you better know if there's any trouble. But to deal with the particular problem that they may not be anxious <laughs> and kind of uh, have a feeling they want to bend the auditor to their will. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley in good corporate governance now more and more demands that the auditor is the province of the auditing committee of the board of directors. And the auditing committee of the board of directors has to be independent in stature. And in fact, and different from the chief executive, different from the chief financial officer. They clearly now have the responsibility to hire and fire the auditor. And if they had that before in, in name, they didn't have it in substance because they would usually take the advice of the CFO or the CEO. Right now, auditing committees understand that their responsibilities are very heavy. And this is a problem. Who wants to be the chairman of an auditing committee if it takes that much time and that much responsibility. Well, how much of that is a problem? I mean, I think the other requirement is that now they're saying there have to be people with true financial right. expertise on these auditing right. committees. Well, you know, you get in the law and some of this gets overdrawn and it gets a little technical, but you do want somebody in charge of the auditing committee. That I don't think I would meet the qualification, the technical <laughs> qualification for what it calls for is in law. But you want people to have some uh, financial understanding and background. Uh, so I, I think it's appropriate that there is some emphasis there. But I think, you know, you've got a big, complicated company now. If you're going to take on a job as chairman of the auditing committee, you've got to be prepared to spend a good amount of time on that job. It can't be a little part-time job where you go to a director's meeting every two months. Well, are the laws too tough? I mean, are you suggesting that Sarbanes-Oxley went too far? No, because I was a great supporter of Sarbanes-Oxley. I think it's unfortunate it was necessary. Uh, and it creates some burdens, but you had to get this mindset and, and kind of lax performance turned around. You kind of have to hit people over the head if they're going to change. Even now, I think there still is quite a lot of denial and the business community or even among auditing firms. You know, you'd like to think, well, there's a bad apple here or there, it's not us, it's not me. You know, you just read the daily paper and the idea that it's just a few bad apples, I well, isn't I think, I think it very much is systemic, and I think part of that is the way the compensation was structured. Sure, I mean, yeah, if you're a partner in a in an auditing firm and you're told you know, we, you have a, a quota, you've got to get your revenues up, aren't they going to want to cut yes. corners? No, I, there's no question that, that, in my view, that that was part of the problem. But it's also a problem much deeper than the auditing firms. Uh, I think there's a problem in remuneration practice and compensation practices right through business. One of my favorite themes is uh, it was the fixed price stock option phenomena that's responsible for a lot of this. Uh, because it, it just gave enormous rewards to some people from getting the stock price up. So all the focus becomes, how do I get my stock price up? And if the business isn't doing too well, maybe we'll manipulate some of the figures. And well, uh, do we have any hope of getting stock options fully expensed? Well, uh, we certainly do. Uh, I mean, putting on my, my Your hat, other hat. <laughs> now, it's being part of the international 
uh, auditing stand uh, accounting, accounting standards committee, uh, the board, which I'm partly responsible for appointing, has proposed and and will finalize a, a standard for expensing stock options very shortly. And I I think the U.S. will have to follow in line there because I think the general consensus is now that yes, indeed, a stock option is an expense, and it's got to be reflected on the income statement and on the balance sheet. How much of the accounting problems are due to the fact that the rules just aren't that clear? I mean, a lot of times, is it really black and white, or is this an enormous area? Well, a lot of the complaint is the opposite, that the rules are, there's an attempt to make the rule too clear. This is kind of a philosophical argument that the Americans, uh, this is their petulant, I guess, getting very detailed in terms of rules to make the rule clear so you can't be sued if you follow the rule and you can take protection and say, I found a rule that permitted to do it, or more likely in this case, I didn't find a rule that said I couldn't do it, so therefore it must be all right. I mean, one illustration of that is the accounting standard, U.S. accounting standard, uh, which its counterpart is now very controversial in Europe by the international. But the U.S. standard, which governs financial instruments, including derivatives that have multiplied like amoeba, uh, is something like a thousand pages long, and nobody really understands it in all its complexity. And that is a that is a problem. And one of the philosophical debates is, shouldn't we have principles stated clearly? But don't make a lot of rules. Count on the auditor and count on the business to follow the principle in good faith. Where do you well, come out on that debate? Well, I'd like to think you come out in that direction, but that takes an auditing profession that is going to have to be very disciplined and professional to apply the principles in a consistent and meaningful way. And I'm not sure we're there yet. I think in practice you could end up someplace in between. And then we'll see how it evolves over time. We'll be right back. The Zicklin School of Business at Brew College of the City University of New York is the largest and most diverse accredited business school in the United States, offering high-quality, full-time and part-time degree programs at the undergraduate, master's and Ph.D. levels. For information about the Zicklin School of Business, please visit our website, zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. That's zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. With me is Paul Volker, former chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Paul, you know, I think that um, one of the big issues is how do you change the culture well, in, in a firm that is going through this huge transition? What can we do to well, help with that? That is what we're struggling with, and that's what I hope to do when I had something to do with uh, Arthur Anderson. And one of my regrets is that that whole effort got thwarted by the fact that they were taken to jail, so to speak, and shut down. Uh, because it's very hard to accomplish that change, and it would have been very hard in Arthur Anderson, and they would have ended up in a smaller firm, but I think a focused firm and focused on the quality of auditing would have turned out to have a, eventually a competitive advantage, and the other firms would have had to follow. That was the dream anyway. Now we're doing it by brute force of, of law, and it's a slow process. I. Uh, you know, the industry of the profession has been demoralized without question during these uh, circumstances to see their dirty laundry exposed so regularly. On the other hand, I am told uh, by some people in the educational area that young people are kind of turned on, uh, people who were halfway interested in accounting and auditing before, saying, oh, you know, this is not the dull green eye shade business we thought it was. It's kind of on the front line, and there's some interest being stimulated. I hope that's true, and in the long run, that will be a very good thing for the profession if you can attract some people who go in for that reason. I think that, that would be great to see a host of, of fresh blood come in there. But I think the other issue is, can you actually be successful in auditing? I mean, if you remove all of these other trappings and you focus well, on auditing, uh, can it be profitable? Well, the auditing firm's argument was they to survive, so to speak, they had to go in these other businesses. Uh, I don't think that's true. Uh, in today's circumstances, when all the shortcomings have been revealed, they are in a position, logically, to charge more for an audit. They're going to have to. It can't be a loss leader. And it can stand on its own two feet. 
economically. Uh, you know, some businesses now think they're being gouged because there's so few auditing firms. Uh, Maybe true in some cases, but I think in general, uh, it is appropriate to be paid more than they were. When you when you look back and see how little we're being paid for audits by big, complicated firms, you begin wondering what kind of a job could they be they doing? Could, could have they been doing? Well, there's a, a classic example of a tax shelter that was being considered. I think it was by KPMG, and they there's a whole series of memos that's been revealed where they looked at it and they said, well, we can charge so much for this tax shelter that we're not going to bother to tell the IRS about it, and if we have to pay the penalties, fine. It's They're tiny by comparison. How do you get well, people uh, to stop seemed, thinking this way? This seemed to me rather clear in the first look I took that one of the big conflicts of interest in the auditing profession was this aggressive tax planning for tax shelters where they were selling something that they were being paid a not an ordinary auditing fee, but something in excess of that. So where does the talent go? Where does their incentive go? Where does their interest go? It goes in that direction. And it could be a complete conflict of interest because then they called upon potentially to audit their own And yet tax this work. went on. This was it clearly on, people at the top didn't say this is wrong. One of my little disappointments is that there was not a explicit demand in Sarbanes-Oxley to eliminate that kind of tax work. But they do have a catch-all that says the new accounting oversight board or the SEC could eliminate it by regulation. And I hope the SEC kind of kicked it over to the new accounting board. And I would like to see them act in this area and this publicity that KPMG, unfortunately for them, has been getting ought to, ought to help them. But it's not, they all do it. How do you feel about the new oversight board? Do you think it can, does it have enough resources and can it well, really be it's, effective? It's, it's going to take some time to build it up, but I, I think it, it's got, the, the leadership is there to make a effective and potentially uh, a vehicle for restoring the kind of auditing profession you'd like to see. It really is a sorry thing that you had to have an official body step in to oversee what should be a self-regulated profession, but the self-regulation had, I'm afraid, fallen, fallen down. So when you add all of these changes up, you, you have uh, no longer the self-regulation. You've got an industry board that is really going to hopefully look hard at these uh, folks. You've got directors who are being more forceful. Uh, you've removed some of the conflicts. You know, you at one point said the accounting industry is in crisis, but it sounds like, can we relax now? Oh, I said it was in crisis before. I'm very proud of that. Before all that Before happened. it all erupted. And I yeah. think we... You nailed it. I think it's been demonstrated. I, uh, but how are we now? I mean, if, well, can I investors think, feel secure? I think we're secure? in flux now. And, you know, it's a period of some uncertainty, but I hope that it will settle down because there is indeed a recognition of crisis. And uh, the recognition, however resisted, however uncertain, the changes have to be made. I think a lot does rest on the the new oversight board, and uh, they are still in the early stages of staffing up and getting things done. But I, I think they're going to have an impact. It just seems to me that there's so few of them, and they're well, such a large industry to be policed. I well, think. that is true, but I, uh, there, there are very few firms to be <laughs> policed Left. now, That's and true. the big ones. Now, one of the complications, those firms are all worldwide, and they're in varying degrees rather loose conglomerates of what used to be national accounting firms. The one exception to that really was Anderson, <laughs> which is more unified. But they weren't completely unified either. And so it's harder to get consistent discipline across the, uh, across the profession. But I, you know, I would really emphasize, I think the difficulties of the auditing and accounting profession are reflective of much wider difficulties in society. Uh, some no argument. No argument here. Yeah. I think we're, you know, it's just important to look at everyone. And right. we're, in this series, we're looking at, at right. everybody who's contributed to this exactly. mess. I think the um, concern with the consolidation is what's this done to competition? I mean, if you've only got three large accounting <laughs> firms left um, and one of them is saying, you know, we view this matter in a slightly more relaxed manner than our competitors do, won't that continue to attract clients and won't that put the competitive pressure well, on the others? so few of them now. I'm not so sure it's a 
question of that kind of competitive pressure, although there may be some, but there aren't many options for a company anymore. They, it's difficult for them to kind of discipline their own auditor because where else can they go? Now, that's got some good and, and bad effects because it's hard to fire an auditor when he, when he says, no, this is the line you cannot go over. The, it's, it's harder for the company to threaten right. them where else are they, they going to go? They have no place to go because uh, they may be using one of the accounting firms for other services and it would be a conflict to take them or, or some firm is not very expert in their own industry. So when you're down to four firms, it really does limit the options. I don't know what you can do to create more. Uh, they are big international conglomerates now and there is a lot of overhead involved now in terms of the amount of automation and electronic assistance and training that it takes. It's going to be hard to to develop a, a real competitor. When you were um, involved with Arthur Anderson, did you hear stories about the kinds of pressure that auditors felt they came under from uh, corporate clients? Oh yeah, I, uh, anything, did you, anything that surprised you or horrified you? or was Well, I, I, mean, I guess I was surprised by the extent of it, but I, there's been a lot of stuff written about this and some very good books written about it. Uh, but you know, I... Uh, still interested. People still come up and tell me how it was. And, and again, not just Arthur Anderson. This was endemic in, uh, in the industry. And, you know, people in Arthur Anderson or outside Arthur Anderson, more importantly, would say, gee, we hope you can do something here because it's really gotten pretty bad. Well, I think what it's shown is how critical, I mean, auditors have tended to be a somewhat overlooked profession. They haven't, no you know, in, and I think what's clear is without proper books that we can trust, how do you figure out well, where to invest? That's the whole object, and we'd like to make them consistent around the world, which gets to my other right. little uh, assignment now, which is in a point of some, uh, Delicacy. not crisis, but I, it's in a nice point of inflection because you've got to get agreement of a lot of countries, and most importantly in Europe, and Europe is rather... Uh, uncertain about whether it wants to adopt one of the important standards. And if it doesn't, it's, it's, it's not going to destroy the effort to get international standards, but it would be a setback. I think it would also be a setback to Europe because you'd be saying, you know, we're not so sure we want disciplined <laughs> international accounting standards, so we want to write our own standards, uh, which is, a, I don't think, the kind of message that should be given at this point. No, clearly I think to have the same global standards across major markets is critical. What can investors do to protect themselves? Well, I, the individual investor clearly can't do very much, but one of the disappointing to me and to a lot of people aspects of the accounting standards, the accounting scandals and the standards and some of the broader concerns is the relative lack I'm going to say lack of interest by institutional investors. Uh, I don't know if it's lack of interest or lack of willingness to take a stand. They themselves have conflicts. Uh, the same people that uh, they might criticize are their potential clients. Uh, Can you give us an example? Well, if you're a mutual fund, a mutual fund company, uh, and you're interested in developing or an investment company of other types, you're interested in developing 401k business. It's a big growing business from a particular corporation. Uh, you're going to be very eager to uh, be on the side of those uh, demanding different corporate governance standards or demanding different auditing standards when you at the same time as maybe hopefully soliciting business or hopefully <laughs> getting business from that company. There may be other reasons, but they've been They've been disappointingly, in my view, passive. Not in every case, but as an industry, the people you count on to be the most forceful advocates, not just of accounting, but of corporate governance, have, with, with those exceptions, been pretty silent. Do you think that's going to change? Do you see some improvement at, at all? Well, I think there's some improvement. The, the state investment funds which don't have the same conflicts tend to be more active but they sometimes have a political agenda of their own which is a little different but it, it's it's changing some but it's been you know really well the consequences of their passivity are, are clear do you think that the consequences to the accounting industry have been sufficient in other words if you if you mess up 
and you have an Enron on your hands, have people been sufficiently punished? Well, psychologically, even if they haven't been directly attacked, and some of them are under a direct attack, uh, they've been pretty punished. But they are punished in the sense that their one indication is their insurance fees have just escalated. An important part of the, their whole cost structure now is the amount they have to pay for ins liability insurance, which is symptomatic of something's the matter when you have to pay that much for it. So for that's insurance. one way to, to put yeah. a cost on it. Thank you, Paul, for joining us today. We'll be right back. Some people think of New York as the world's second home. The City University of New York, with students coming from 90 countries and speaking more than 155 languages, is the world's first university. Find us on the web at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-YES. Things are unquestionably better than they were. Many accounting firms have reduced or eliminated the consulting practices which generated so much revenue that it made it hard for them to focus sufficiently on their less profitable auditing functions. There's stronger industry oversight too, and new laws make it easier to maintain an appropriate distance between an auditor and his client. However, the underlying economic pressures that caused the industry to cut corners in the first place haven't gone away. Today, CEOs no longer get to handpick their auditors. That responsibility has been placed squarely in the hands of boards of directors. But until those directors choose an auditing firm because of its reputation for being tough, because it won't bend the rules and allow a company to inflate earnings or hide debt, and until those boards are willing to pay extra for that service, the auditing industry will continue to be prone to ethical lapses in the name of improving its own profits. For USA Inc., I'm Sarah Bartlett.